Hello, and welcome to the first episode of The Lives and Times, a series where we examine history's most interesting, infamous, or just plain strange figures and the times in which they lived. On this episode, we examine the life and legacy of Saint Olga of Kiev. Both Christian saint and princess of the Kievan Rus, Olga is a fascinating character and she is perhaps most well known for the particularly bloody life she led before converting to Christianity. I'm your host, James, and thank you for joining me today as we explore the life and times of Saint Olga of Kiev. Now, before we get started, I'll first talk about the sources that we'll be using this episode. Now, the main source we're going to be using today is the Russian Primary Chronicle, otherwise known as the Tale of Bygone Years. This work is pretty much essential when looking at anything to do with early Russian and Slavic history. This chronicle was supposedly compiled by the 12th century monk Saint Nestor of Kiev, utilising both his own writings and older Slavic historical texts. We will be using other primary sources to provide reference and detail to today's episode, but for the most part, the primary chronicle will be our guide, as it is the only surviving Slavic history contemporary to this period. Now, it's important to note that dating certain events within this chronicle is very difficult, as the author does not always calculate the date correctly when compared with Byzantine sources that cover the same period. So, forgive me if I'm not able to put a precise date to some events, and be aware that some of the given dates are contested by historians. So, let's start with a bit of historical context. Who were the Kievan Rus, and why do we call them that? Well, the Kievan Rus were a federation of the Slavic tribes that settled in Eastern Europe, spanning from the lands northeast of the Danube River to the Neva River on the Black Sea. As is the case with most ancient and medieval civilizations, these borders were not clear-cut, and the authority of the Kievan Rus over various regions fluctuates wildly. But roughly speaking, the Kievan Rus heartlands occupied much of what now comprises Ukraine, Belarus, and Western Russia. Their name derives, quite simply, from the name of their capital, Kiev, which still stands today as the capital of Ukraine. According to legend, this city was founded by the chief of a Slavic people known as the Polyanians, a man named Ki and his three siblings, who constructed the city of Kiev upon the hills of the western bank of the river Dnieper, near to the mouth of the Desna River, which flows east into Russia. As for the Rus part of the name, this is slightly more complicated. Though Kiev was founded by the Polyanian Slavs, the primary chronicle states that after a period of infighting amongst the Slavic tribes and frequent raids from the nomadic Khazars of the Eurasian steppe, the Slavic tribes invited the Varangian tribe of Rus to rule over them. The term Varangian refers broadly to the Scandinavian Norse peoples that we might refer to as Vikings. The Slavic delegation sailed to the land of the Varangian Rus and stated the following, Our land is great and rich, but there is no order in it. Come to rule and reign over us. Fairly simple request, and the Varangian Rus agreed. Prince Rurik of the Rus and his two brothers, along with their families, returned with the Slavs, and Rurik set up his capital in Novgorod, city of the Ilmen Slavs of Lake Ilmen. Prince Rurik is something of a legendary figure in Russian history, as he founded one of the greatest dynasties in Russian history, the Rurikids and a descendant of Rurik's that we know as Ivan the Terrible would go on to found the first true Russian state in 1547. Now, two of Rurik's companions, named Askold and Dur, travelled down the river Dnieper en route to Constantinople, but stopped at Kiev on the way. After seeing the city was largely undefended, they raised a large band of Varangians and assumed control of the city and the Polyanian Slavs who lived there. After the death of Prince Rurik, control over the lands of the Rus and Rurik's infant son Igor went to Oleg, a kinsman of Rurik. Now Prince of the Rus, Oleg went on to Kiev with Igor and encountered Askold and Dur. Upon seeing that they were not of noble birth, Oleg had them killed and announced that Kiev would now be the new mother city of the Rus, and thus did the Rus become the Rus of Kiev, or the Kievan Rus as we know them. Conveniently, it is also at this point in history that our story of St. Olga begins. Prince Oleg, after establishing Kiev as the mother city of the Rus, sought out a wife for the young Igor. Oleg chose a woman named Olga, hailing from the city of Pskov, just west of Novgorod, where Prince Rurik originally reigned. Her date of birth is not recorded, but the primary chronicle claims that she was presented to Igor in 903 CE, and she probably would have been in her early teens at the time. 
Leaving Igor and Olga in Kiev, Prince Oleg went on to attack the Byzantines, raiding the land around Constantinople before securing a mutually beneficial peace with the Emperor Leo, establishing trade between the Byzantine Empire and the Kievan Rus. Though not yet formally established, this is also the likely origin of the Varangian Guard, the elite bodyguards of the Byzantine emperors drawn from northern European stock. Oleg returned to Kiev triumphant and died in 912, with the now adult Igor succeeding him as Prince of the Kievan Rus. I'll briefly talk about Oleg's death, as it's actually quite amusing, and is mentioned in both the Primary Chronicle and the Norse Saga of Orvar Oder. Allegedly, Prince Oleg was told by his priests that a stallion that he owned, yet had not ridden, would be the cause of his death. Fearing this prophecy, Oleg sent the stallion away and commanded that it be taken care of, yet never brought into his presence. Five years later, Oleg inquired as to where the stallion had been taken. His followers told him that the horse was dead, and that its bones still lay where it had died. Upon hearing this, Oleg laughed and said, Soothsayers tell untruths, and their words are naught but falsehood. This horse is dead, but I am still alive. Oleg then demanded that he be taken to see the bones of his dead stallion. Upon coming across the desiccated skull of the horse, Oleg proclaimed, So I was supposed to receive my death from this skull? At which point Oleg stamped on the skull of the stallion with his boot, disturbing a snake that had taken up residence within. The snake slithered out of the horse's skull and bit Oleg, killing him and fulfilling the prophecy. So, like Oedipus of Greek myth, Prince Oleg could not outrun fate despite his best efforts. Whether the story is true or just a warning against hubris and the dangers of prophecy, who can say, but it certainly makes for an interesting story. So, with Oleg dead and Igor now Prince of the Kievan Rus, things immediately got off to a bad start. The tribe of Slavs known as the Derevlians, who had previously paid tribute to Prince Oleg, refused to pay tribute to Prince Igor and resisted his authority. Igor promptly attacked the Derevlians, invading their land of Derever, and he conquered them, demanding that they pay him even greater tribute than they had originally paid to Oleg. Now, the Primary Chronicle does not go into great detail regarding the reign of Igor. It is recorded that Igor waged war on the Peshnegs, a nomadic Turkic people who had settled north of the Black Sea, and the Byzantines, who Igor was able to secure favourable treaties with, facilitating trade between the Rus and the Greeks, as Oleg had done during his reign. In the year 943, a son was born to Prince Igor and Olga, named Sviatoslav, who was raised in Kiev. The Derevlians, who clearly resented being forced to pay tribute to the Kievan Rus, decided in 945 to again cease paying tribute to Igor. Naturally, upon hearing this news, Igor assembled a retinue and marched right back into Derevar to demand payment. Upon reaching the city of Iskorosten, Igor demanded the Derevlians pay tribute, which, to their credit, they did. They were probably afraid that Igor would again conquer them and subject them to even harsher terms. Satisfied, Igor turned around and led his retinue away from the city. However, it occurred to Igor that even more could be demanded from the Derevlians, and he dismissed his retinue to return to Kiev with their spoils, while he rode back to Iskorosten with a few of his followers to gather more tribute. Upon hearing that Igor was returning for more tribute, the Derevlians became understandably quite concerned, and they consulted with their prince, a man named Mal, about what should be done. The Derevlians came to the following conclusion. If a wolf come among the sheep, he will take away the whole flock one by one, unless he be killed. If we do not thus kill him now, he will destroy us all. So the Derevlians sent a messenger forward, asking Igor why he was returning when he had already collected all of the tribute. When Igor ignored the messenger, a band of Derevlians rode out from Iskorosten and killed Igor before he could reach the city. Now the Primary Chronicle doesn't actually specify how Prince Igor was killed, but the Byzantine chronicler Leo the Deacon does. He claims that Igor was suspended between two trees that had been bent down with ropes, and the trees were then released to spring back upwards, tearing the prince in two down the middle. Gruesome. But this detail might just be an embellishment, likely a reference to the Greek mythical figure of Sinus, a bandit who would execute his captives in this particularly unpleasant manner. So, with Prince Igor dead, 
the Drevlians decided to take this opportunity to utilize the power vacuum in Kiev that they had assumed would result from the death of Igor. Princess Olga was now a widow, and her son, Sviatoslav, now Prince of Kiev, was too young to reign himself. The Drevlians decided to propose a marriage between their Prince Mal and Olga. In doing so, the young Prince Sviatoslav could be influenced by Mal and could be utilized in the future. Deciding on this course of action, the Derevlians sent 20 of their best warriors to Kiev by boat to act as envoy and present this proposal to Olga. Upon hearing that the Derevlian delegation had arrived, Olga warmly welcomed them to Kiev and inquired as to why they were here. The Derevlians replied straightforwardly that Igor was a tyrant, and he had fallen upon Dereva like a ravening wolf. The righteous Derevlian princes, acting for the good of their own land, had slain Igor and now wished to preserve the peace by proposing that Olga marry Prince Mal and come with them to Dereva. Olga made a show of considering this offer, and replied, quote, Your proposal is pleasing to me. Indeed, my husband cannot rise again from the dead, but I desire to honour you tomorrow in the presence of my people. Return now to your boat and remain there with an aspect of arrogance. I shall send for you on the morrow, and you shall say, We will not ride on horses, nor go on foot. Carry us in our boat." and you shall be carried in your boat. This was, perhaps, rather a strange course of action, considering that at the time the city of Kiev was situated on the hills, whilst the Derevlians were down in the river valley below, at a place called Borishev. Carrying a boat filled with 20 men up to the city would have been quite the task, I imagine. Regardless, the Derevlians thought this sounded good, and they returned to their boat, carrying with them an air of arrogance, which they would certainly cultivate for the next day's ceremony. Meanwhile, Olga commanded that a deep ditch be dug in a stone hall outside of the city, presumably to the confusion of her people. The next day, as instructed, the twenty Derevlian warriors sat in their boat in their full finery and exclaimed, when greeted by Olga's messengers, We will not ride on horseback, nor in wagons, nor go on foot. Carry us in our boats. The people of Kiev then began to despair thinking that Olga would actually marry the Derevlian prince, and that they would be made slaves of the Derevlians. Regardless, they did as ordered, and carried the Derevlians up to the stone hall in their boat, where Olga waited for them. Upon being carried into the hall, the Derevlians and their boat were unceremoniously dumped into the pit that had been prepared the day before. The primary chronicle describes the scene that followed. Olga bent over and inquired whether they found the honour to their taste. They answered that it was worse than the death of Igor, she then commanded that they should be buried alive, and thus they were buried. How very undignified for the Derevlians, but things were about to get worse. Not fully satisfied with this, Olga then sent a message to the Derevlians, telling them that if they were serious about their offer, they would send their finest and most distinguished men to go and collect her, otherwise her people simply would not let her go. The Derevlians received this message, and, unaware of the fate of their first delegation, sent their best men to Kiev post-haste. This was most likely a collection of Derevlian nobles and distinguished landholders from the region. Upon their arrival in Kiev, Olga again welcomed them warmly to her city and commanded that the weary travellers be taken to the bathhouse so that they may bathe before meeting with her to negotiate. Thus, the Derevlian delegation was led to a bathhouse, which, in those times, in this part of the world, would have been a large wooden hut in which water was heated to steam, raising the temperature inside the hut to anywhere between 80 to 95 degrees Celsius. On a side note, if this setup sounds familiar, it should. This is actually one of the earliest descriptions we have of a Russian banya, which are still in use today and can be found in many major cities all across the world. If you've ever been to one, you might notice people hitting themselves with thick brooms of leaves. Funnily enough, this practice is also described earlier in the primary chronicle in the city of Novgorod. It reads... They warm them to extreme heat, then undress, and after anointing themselves with tallow, they take young reeds and lash their bodies. They actually lash themselves so violently that they barely escape alive. Then they drench themselves with cold water and are thus revived. They think nothing of doing this every day and actually inflict such voluntary torture on themselves. They make the act not a mere washing, but a veritable torment. And there we have it a medieval custom that actually survives to the modern day. I might actually visit a banya once this pandemic is finished, though I'd rather not be lashed so violently that I barely escape alive. Nor would I like to meet the fate that awaits these Derevlians, 
from whom I've so effectively sidetracked from. Now, going back to the story. The Derevlians undressed and entered the bathhouse, which had been heated in preparation for their arrival. But heat would soon be found in abundance, as after the last of the Derevlians entered the bathhouse, Olga ordered the doors to be barred shut. And according to the Primary Chronicle, she gave orders to set it on fire from the doors, so that the Derevlians were all burned to death. Now at this point, you might think that Olga had gotten it all out of her, but no. There was still more avenging to be done, and so she dispatched another message to Dereva, saying, quote, I am now coming to you, so prepare great quantities of mead in the city where you killed my husband, that I may weep over his grave and hold a funeral feast for him. Still unaware of the fates of their last two delegations, the Derevlians were anxious to meet Princess Olga, and, as ordered, gathered huge amounts of honey, which they used to brew mead. Olga departed from Kiev with a small retinue, heading for the grave of Prince Igor, situated near the site of his death outside of the Drevlian city of Iskorosten. When Olga and her party arrived, she wept at her husband's tomb, and had her followers construct a great mound in memory of him. On another side note, this burial mound is called a Kurgan, and was the traditional way that the Varangian Rus were buried. Indeed, Prince Igor's father, Oleg, was buried beneath a Kurgan, which allegedly still stands today, about 110 kilometers east of St. Petersburg, at a town called Staraya Ladoga. There's several other burial mounds nearby, so if you ever find yourself in the area, it might be worth a visit. Anyways, once Olga had mourned her husband, she ordered that a funerary feast be held, and that mead be drunk. Olga told the Drevlians to get started on the mead, and that her followers would wait upon them and refill their cups. At this point, the Derevlians, probably between horns of mead, asked Olga where the delegations they had sent to Kiev were, to which Olga replied that they were following behind with her husband's bodyguard. This is probably a morbid joke, as Igor's bodyguards were dead, along with Igor, hinting at the fate of the Derevlian delegations. But now deep into their cups or horns, the Derevlians did not pick up on this and continued knocking back their mead, once the Drevlians were quite drunk and lounging about in a stupor, Olga commanded her retinue fall upon the Drevlians and kill them, which they did, with gusto. The Primary Chronicle claims that some 5,000 Drevlians were massacred by Olga's retinue, and that she herself went around egging them on as they butchered the Drevlians. Wasting no time, Olga and her retinue left the bloody scene and returned to Kiev, amassing a large army to capitalise on their deceit. When the army was mustered, Olga marched, along with her young son, Prince Sviatoslav, into Dereva and began to pillage. The Derevlians sent out an army to meet them, and the two armies clashed. Here, the young Prince Sviatoslav made his debut appearance in combat, throwing his spear at the Derevlians to begin the battle. This practice actually gives us some insight into the religion of the pre-Christian Kievan Rus. In the Norse pagan religion, it is custom to begin the battle by throwing your spear against the enemy, thus dedicating the battle to come to the honour of the All-Father Odin. However, since Sviatoslav was only a child and the spear was probably rather heavy, the spear, quote, barely cleared the horse's ear and struck against his leg. Regardless, their heroic prince had acted, and the battle was consecrated in the name of the All-Father. The Rus took this as the signal to attack, which they did, crushing the Derevlian army and forcing the remainder to flee for safety inside the city of Iskorosten. Events had come full circle, and once again the Rus marched on Iskorosten, laying siege to the city. However, Iskorosten was well fortified, and the Drevlians were firmly barricaded within, fighting off any attempts to breach the city's defences. At this point, the Drevlians had wised up to Olga's plan, and were determined to keep her out of the city, fearing what fresh revenge she would exact upon them. Probably a smart move. Now this siege apparently lasted for an entire year, the Derevlians were still stubbornly holding on to their city, despite being blockaded by the Rus, and Olga was losing patience. So she sent them the following message. Quote, Why do you persist in holding out? All your cities have surrendered to me, and submitted to tribute, so that the inhabitants now cultivate their fields and their lands in peace. But you rather die of hunger without submitting to tribute. Now, naturally, the Derevlians were extremely suspicious of Olga and responded saying that they were happy to submit tribute but were worried that Olga would continue to exact more revenge upon them. Olga replied straightforwardly, quote, 
since I have already avenged the misfortune of my husband twice on the occasions when your messengers came to Kiev, and a third time when I held a funeral feast for him, I do not desire further revenge, but am anxious to receive a small tribute. After I have made peace with you, I shall return home again. Sounds reasonable. So the Drevlians asked what she would like to receive as tribute, and they offered the meagre amount of honey and furs that they had in their city. Olga declined this, saying that they had no honey or furs to offer, and instead she said the following, Give me three pigeons and three sparrows from every house. I do not desire to impose a heavy tribute like my husband, but I require only this small gift from you, for you are impoverished by the siege. How very benevolent of her, right? Well, the Drevlians thought so, and gladly went around the city gathering all the pigeons and sparrows that they could find. These birds typically make their nests in roofs and holes and crevices within buildings could be quite a nuisance, so gathering enough birds proved to be an easy enough thing for the Drevlians, who happily gave their feathery bounty to Olga, still alive and chirping of course. Olga was pleased by this, and handed each of her soldiers a pigeon or a sparrow, telling them to use thread to tie to the birds a piece of sulphur bound with small pieces of cloth. Do you see where this is going? Well, when the night fell... Olga ordered the soldiers to set these little cloth and sulphur packages alight and release the birds to return home. The Primary Chronicle paints a good picture of the following events. Quote, so the birds flew to their nests, the pigeons to the coats, and the sparrows under the eaves. Thus the dovecoats, the coops, the perches, and the haymows were set on fire. There was not a house that was not consumed, and it was impossible to extinguish the flames because all the houses caught fire at once. The people fled from the city, and Olga ordered her soldiers to catch them. Thus she took the city and burned it, and captured the elders of the city. Some of the other captives she killed, while she gave others as slaves to her followers, the remnants she left to pay tribute. And if killing their envoys twice, slaughtering their funeral attendants, and crushing their army in battle and burning their city down wasn't enough, the tribute imposed by Olga was particularly harsh, two-thirds of which went to Kiev, one-third to Novgorod. Finally satisfied, Olga returned to Kiev with Sviatoslav in 946, establishing trade routes and enforcing Rus law upon the Derevlians as she went. And that finally concludes Olga's revenge upon the Derevlians for her husband's death, probably giving the bride from Kill Bill a run for her money. Now, this is where Olga's story takes a slight turn, because, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, Olga is actually a saint. So how did this happen? Well, some years after Olga concluded her revenge against the Derevlians, she decided to visit Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, and a city which the Kievan Rus called Tsargrad, literally the city of Caesar. Now, the Primary Chronicle records this visit in great detail and claims that Olga arrived in 948. This is heavily disputed among scholars, based on Byzantine sources and irregularities in the Primary Chronicle, so this might have actually occurred some ten years after this date. The academic jury is still out on this. Regardless, when Olga arrived, she met with the Byzantine Emperor Constantine VII, who was immediately enamoured with Olga, praising her fair countenance as well as her keen intellect. After conversing with her, Constantine expressed his desire for Olga to remain with him in Constantinople as his wife and reign over the Byzantine Empire by his side. Now, Olga, apparently quite familiar with the customs of the Empire, replied that she could not, for she was a pagan, and that if Constantine wished her baptised, he must do it himself. Constantine accepted this and agreed to baptise Olga, performing the ceremony with the assistance of the Patriarch of Constantinople. Due to the discrepancy in dates, this could have either been Patriarch Theophylactus or Patriarch Polyuctus. Either way, the Primary Chronicle states that Olga was baptised by the Emperor of Byzantium and the Ecumenical Patriarch of the Orthodox Church, which is quite an impressive introduction to the Christian faith. Olga was given the Christian name Helena, in honour of Saint Helena, mother of Constantine the Great, founder of Constantinople and the first Christian Emperor of Rome. Olga was also tutored in the Orthodox faith by the Patriarch, Olga's conversion appears to be quite genuine. The Primary Chronicle claims that Olga absorbed the Patriarch's teaching like a sponge absorbs water. But there was a trick to be played by Olga, for the Emperor Constantine VII still wanted to marry her, and so he asked her again, to which she responded, quote, How can you marry me? 
after yourself baptizing me and calling me your daughter. For among Christians, that is unlawful, as you yourself must know. And she was right. The 8th century Byzantine legal manual, the Ecloga of Leo III, expresses quite clearly that, quote, a man and woman could not be either betrothed or married if they are related to one another in baptism. So, Constantine, defeated, conceded that Olga had outwitted him and, quote, gave her many gifts of gold, silver, silks, and various vases, and dismissed her, still calling her his daughter. This is a nice story, though this part is likely embellished as Constantine already had a wife, also called Helena, and while consorts were not uncommon for Byzantine emperors, to divorce his Greek wife and marry the widow of a Russian chieftain would most likely have caused considerable scandal. However, that Olga was baptised in Constantinople seems genuine, 11th century Byzantine historian John Scalitzes records in his Synopsis of History that Olga did indeed visit Constantinople during the reign of Constantine VII and was baptised and honoured for her faith. Likewise, the De Ceremonis, or Book of Ceremonies, commissioned by Constantine VII himself, also states that Olga and a delegation of the Rus visited Constantinople and was given a lavish welcome by the imperial household. Anyways... After Olga was baptised and well-versed in the practices and customs of the Orthodox faith, she was anxious to return to her people. So, she received a hearty blessing from the patriarch, who had tutored her, and was sent on her way accompanied by a retinue of Orthodox priests who would aid her in Christianising the Kievan Rus. From this point on, Olga seems to have put her bloody ways behind her, and she lived the remainder of her life in Kiev seeking wisdom and proselytising the Christian faith to her people. She does not appear to have been that successful, though. The Primary Chronicle, while writing a glowing review of Olga and her newfound faith, claims that those who were baptised were subjected to scorn and mockery by their peers, and it was for this reason that Prince Sviatoslav, Olga's son, now fully grown and invested with his power as prince, chose not to be baptised, preferring the old faith of the Rus. Though Olga wished her son to convert, she did not press him unduly, and she died, naturally in the year 969 in Kiev, on July 11th. Prince Sviatoslav would go on to become a legendary figure in Slavic and Russian history, but for the rest of his story, we'll have to wait for another episode. As for Christianity in the Kievan Rus, it was Olga's grandson, Prince Vladimir, who would officially Christianise the Kievan Rus in 988, earning himself recognition as a saint, like his grandmother. Having covered the events of Princess Olga's life, now is a good time to talk about her canonization as a saint. In the year 1547, the Russian Orthodox Church decreed that Olga was a saint of the Christian faith due to her efforts to spread Christianity in her pagan homeland, and in recognition of the virtuous life she supposedly lived after her baptism. The Roman Catholic Church also recognised Olga as a saint, though she was, and still is, mostly venerated in Eastern European and Slavic churches. Olga's bloody revenge against the Derevlians, though seemingly unsaintly behaviour, was regarded as a remnant of the pagan life she left behind, but also a sign of her devotion to her marriage, and thus Olga is venerated as the patron saint of widows and converts. You can find churches and cathedrals dedicated to Olga all across the world, but particularly in Ukraine, Russia and Belarus. A monument of Olga can be found in Piskov, the city of her birth, along with a chapel, bridge, and international airport named in her honour. In Kiev, you can find the Cathedral of St. Olga, built in 1994, as well as a monument dedicated to her in Mikhailovskaya Square, alongside St. Andrew the Apostle, who allegedly consecrated the site that Kiev would be built upon, and St. Cyril and Methodius, two 9th century Byzantine missionaries who are credited with bringing Christianity to the Slavs and codifying the first written Slavic alphabet allowing for Slavic language Bibles to be translated. The Order of Princess Olga was established in 1997 by the Ukrainian president Leonid Kuzma and is a civil decoration awarded to women who display quote, personal merits in state, production, scientific, educational, cultural, charity or other spheres of social activities for upbringing children in families. July 11th is marked as St. Olga's Feast Day and is still celebrated by many Orthodox and Eastern European churches. So, next time that date rolls around, spare a thought to the sainted Princess Olga. As a pagan princess hell-bent on avenging her murdered husband, 
or as a wise and pious saint living the remainder of her life peacefully in Kiev, or both. Either way, it's safe to say that she is a fascinating and complex figure whose legacy lives on to this day in many parts of the world. Thank you for joining me today on this episode of The Lives and Times, and I'll see you next time.